I love cooking, but I especially love cooking when I have beautiful cookware to do it in. I recently started using an R Place Always Pan and Dutch oven, and I love that not only do they make cooking more beautiful, they look so nice sitting on my stovetop that I don't even need to find somewhere to store them. Our Place is a mission-driven and female-founded brand that makes beautiful kitchen products that are healthy, sustainable, and made without PFAS, forever chemicals that are under increasing global scrutiny for their impact on the environment and on our health. Leading the change, Our Place has always been PFAS-free and offers the most durable, toxin-free ceramic coatings, ensuring a healthy, safe cooking experience. And they're beautifully designed in a range of colors that elevate any home. Find out why Our Place has 75,000 five-star reviews on their award-winning products. Plus, Our Place offers a 100-day trial with free shipping and returns. Go to fromourplace.com and enter my code CURIOUSLY at checkout to receive 10% off site-wide. That's fromourplace.com, code CURIOUSLY. Welcome to Curiously Caitlin, where we try to make theology make sense. Each week, we will hear a kid question about God, theology, or the Bible, and find a scholar who can answer it. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Dr. Alex Osler, thank you so much for joining me today. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. This is Dr. Alex Sossler. He is an assistant professor of Bible and ministry at Montreat College, assisting priest at Redeemer Anglican Church in Asheville, North Carolina, and the author of A Short Guide to Spiritual Formation, Finding Life in Truth, Goodness, Beauty, and Community. Let's hear our kid question that I think is a really perfect one for you. How do we know when we have a strong relationship with God? I just love hearing the kid voices yeah, <laughs> and like struggling over yeah. the word relationship. <laughs> but what is your initial reaction to this question? How do we know yeah. when we have a strong relationship with God? Yeah, it's such a beautiful question um, to ask, I think, to to even desire it, to desire what it means or, or um, what it looks like, I think, is an encouragement. I, I'm reminded of St. Augustine's line uh, that goes something like, to desire grace is the beginning of grace. You might have noticed that we keep bringing up Augustine. He was not only a bishop and theologian in the early church, he wrote a lot about all areas of theology, most books of the Bible, and a lot about spiritual life. If you've never read any Augustine and you're at all curious about him, his book Confessions would be a good place to start. It's his conversion story, and it's a classic book that has shaped how a lot of Christians across history have thought about the spiritual life. And I think in the same way, like to desire a good relationship or a strong mm-hmm. relationship with God is the beginning of a good relationship with God. So just that the, that seed is there is an encouragement to me. Um, and I think it's, it's a kind of a scriptural warrant that we ought to test ourselves to see if we're in the faith. When Dr. Sosler says scripture teaches us to test ourselves— He's referring to 2 Corinthians 13.5, where it says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. In the context of Paul's letter, it's an answer to people who are comparing themselves favorably to others, boasting about their superior spirituality. Paul's counsel is, how about you test yourself? We're going to talk more about baptism in other episodes. What is it? What does it mean? But it's important to add here that even in traditions that don't baptize infants, but believers after they have professed faith in Christ, the same thing Dr. Sossler is saying here is true. It's all grace. We are dependent upon God to save us. We don't save ourselves. To see if we're walking this, to assume that I'm good, um, is probably an indicator that it may not be strong. Um, And so I think it's, it's a beautiful question. Yeah, I love I love that most of these questions tell us something about what kids in church are picking up about what's mm-hmm. happening in church. They're learning something of how to test out this language and these ideas. Um, and I imagine this kid might be asking this because they feel kind of anxious about this. I've heard people in church talk about having a good relationship. I want to know if what I experience is a good relationship. 
what would you describe as evidence of that in someone's yeah. life? Either this kid or a Grown up might be asking this too, thinking about themselves, or they might also be looking around for models to follow and saying, like, what does a good relationship with God look like in other people and how could I follow that? Yeah. Yeah, I think I would found it in, um, and this is, uh, I'm going to be a little bit Anglican here in my my collar wearing, but I think the foundation of it is, <laughs> is are you baptized? And I think like whatever language you use, do you have a personal relationship with Christ? Have you accepted him into your heart or have you been baptized? Is to say, we depend on grace. And it's so easy to take this question as kind of a checkbox Christianity, right? Like I'm doing this, I'm checking these things, and we're kind of depending on our own effort, our own works. And so I think the the foundation is 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 baptism. Like when Jesus is baptized— before he does any public ministry, right? He is, he is new on the scene, right? Beginning of the Gospels. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And if we're found in Christ, that that same thing is true of us when we're baptized. You are God's beloved daughter. You are God's beloved son. And God is pleased with you. We work from grace. And so it, it, in this kind of checkbox thing, it, you are beloved um, you have been baptized. You have been adopted as part of God's family. You have a strong relationship with God. You have a good relationship with God because you are part of God's family. Um, and so I think that that would be my foundation, like the, this kind of foundation of grace. And I think in the Anglican tradition or any kind of infant baptism, this is what we signify by baptizing babies. Before they do anything good or bad, it's it's like the most helpless, dependent state that you are. And at that point, God marks you as his own. Mm. Right before you do anything, and so, and so, just to kind of depend on that objective evidence, you've been baptized. Trust God's grace for you. You have a strong relationship. We're going to talk more about baptism in other episodes. What is it? What does it mean? But it's important to add here that even in traditions that don't baptize infants, but believers after they have professed faith in Christ, the same thing Dr. Sossler is saying here is true. It's all grace. We are dependent upon God to save us. We don't save ourselves. I was talking to my wife about this question, too. She's like, so you're saying, like, they don't need to do anything else. They're just baptized and they're good, right? Kind of like once saved, <laughs> you, you're, you're dunked, and then you don't have to do anything. In a sense, like, you don't have to do anything, but there's markers or there's evidences or there's kind of um, ways that you can, that can, that can guide your own assurance. Like, can, can we be assured that we're kind of walking in the faith? And I, and I think even right the popular ways, at least when I was growing up, how do you know how to have a good relationship? I think for me, when I first became a Christian and kind of went the academic crowd and kind of doing my MDA base, do you know the right things? Right? Do, do you believe the right things? And, and sometimes like that's our only way of growth is like, okay, read the Bible and pray. And if, you, if you're having trouble, just believe harder. You just need to kind of think about it more, believe more and you'll be fine. And it's kind of intellectual, right? The other way is to think, do you feel the right way? Do you have the right feeling? Can you trust your own, you know, feelings? Mm -hmm. You feel like you have a good relationship, do you have a good relationship? Like kind of the emotion. I don't know if that's a, a great standard or kind of just the works righteousness, the practical. Are you doing these things? Knowing the right things, feeling the right way, or doing the right things, I think are, are ways that maybe people misinterpret or kind of make it a works righteousness in, in some ways. You might have heard this phrase before, works righteousness. This is one of those phrases that has a specific meaning in academic circles, but has taken on a broader meaning outside of them. Most of the time when people say works righteousness in the church, they mean any attempt to secure your standing with God by your own works, by the good things you do or the sin you avoid rather than seeing good works as a response to the prior grace of God. So I think my answer, kind of in light of that, kind of the, 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 maybe the errors of an over-dependence on intellect, emotion, or practice, is um, are you showing up for the regular means of grace? I think so often, I think this anxiety that you maybe even talked about in this question is like, well, I see Susie over there, and she seems more excited than I am. And I see John over there, and he knows more than I am. Mm. More than I do. And it's kind of comparative of, like, where do I fit in this? And I think, like, more and more, like, I want to encourage people to say, like, um, 
God does meet us in the ex- extraordinary, right? He does do extraordinary things. He does work by us. But maybe more often than not, he meets us in word and sacrament. Dr. Sossler uses a phrase here that might be unfamiliar to some of us, word and sacrament. It's a shorthand way of referring to what we do when we gather together as a Christian community. We hear the word of God preached and we participate in the sacraments, the central practices of the Christian faith. So like, are you seeking a good relationship with God by showing up to church, by participating in the ways that the church has has guided us in? Uh, And so, yeah, God meets us in these very ordinary ways. Are you walking in the light as God in the, is in the light, right? First John, I think there's like reading First John is like a really great kind of practical, like, are you confessing sin? Do you see that you have sin that you are confessing because God is just to forgive us of that sin? Uh, so kind of those ways, uh, are you seeing sin? Are you confessing sin? Are you loving others? Can you look around and say, okay, even to my own hurt sometimes, even in my own sacrifice, I'm sharing this toy, right, for, for a thing. I'm honoring, right, the, the first commandment of the promise. I'm honoring my mother and father. Maybe not all the time, right, where we have sin, we confess our sin, but is there a growing desire to share, to love your brother and sister? How are you going to love God if you can't love those next to you or those closest to you, right? Uh, do you see the fruit of the Spirit, right, that he's kind of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Do you see those things? And is your affection growing towards God? And I, and I know those things are sometimes hard to measure. Um, and so I think like that's why the church is so great, just kind of like go to your parents, to your pastor, to your friend and say, hey, do you notice me being a kinder um, child? Do you notice me mm. sharing more um, and not complaining about it or complaining about doing the chores, whatever it is. Do you see these fruits in my life? And the church can kind of affirm that back and say, you're doing great. Um, and I think that's what the, the public witness of the church is so great. Uh, so there's maybe a few markers. I don't know, that was maybe rambly, but. No, that was great. That was great. And I I appreciate that you started out with the the forms that already just belong to us in the church for experiencing this because I think a lot of people listening probably can relate to that anxiety of like, I'm not sure what the standards are. I have to kind of figure out how to measure myself. And I did not grow up in a church that communicated to me what you just said about baptism or communicated to me when you receive communion, this is a form of grace and and you doing it even when you don't feel exactly what you imagine you might feel, like there is a gift here for you and there can be some rest in that and some security in that. Yeah. And I think that's a real gift for people across traditions, even if your tradition thinks differently about both of those practices, sacraments, that those can still be a way for you to say, okay, I'm relying on the church. I'm relying on this community. I'm relying on the forms God has given. And I don't feel like it's just a totally subjective process of me kind of figuring out where I am. First John 3 has this great line that even if our conscience condemns us, God is greater than our conscience. And I think like that is just so amazing. Like even when we think, man, I've I'm screwing it up. I don't have a strong relationship. God is stronger than our own subjective feelings. And I think that even the church's witness to say, like, it doesn't depend merely on your feelings sometimes. Like, we want an affection for God. We want our emotions to be engaged in our worship of God. But even if it doesn't, even if we feel unrighteous, unholy, not strong relationship with God, that we can meet with the church and say, God's stronger than your conscience. Your baptism's stronger than your conscience. Your acceptance of Christ in your life is the objective evidence. And so you can be assured. We like our, our spiritual formation, our growth to kind of be an upward trajectory. But this thing is kind of, we're bouncing all around and we have a steady growth, walking in the light more, confessing our sin more. Then we can look back and say, man, I'm, I'm strong. I'm more mature than when I started, but I mean, I want it to be kind of this steady growth that oftentimes, unfortunately, it's just not. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
you have you just used a phrase that you've written a whole book about spiritual formation. Can you give us just a, an overall description of, of what that is? Uh, because there are probably folks that are familiar with it. There's been a lot more talk of it in lots of churches in the last few years. But some of us grew up in churches where maybe spiritual formation or definitely spiritual disciplines would have felt like pretty foreign concepts or maybe even something to be kind of suspicious of. How would you describe what spiritual formation just very generally is? When we're talking about spiritual formation, in some ways we're talking about discipleship, how we grow in Christ. Um, I think I have a definition in the book that goes something like the holistic process by which we grow into the fullness of Christ um, and so in the book, I talk about truth, these traditions of truth, goodness, beauty, community, that those are the transcendentals that point to the transcendent one. Dr. Sossler uses a couple important words here, transcendent and transcendental. Transcendent means beyond ordinary human experience. When talking about God as transcendent, we mean God is higher, greater, and beyond us. God is totally other than his creation. We've talked about this a bunch of times, that creator-creature distinction. The transcendentals are one way philosophers have thought about properties that transcend particular examples of them. So a flower or a person might be beautiful, but what is beauty itself? Traditionally, some philosophers have listed the transcendentals as these, beauty, truth, and goodness. So if God makes us, he's the transcendent one, and he makes us in his image, and he is the all good, all true, all beautiful, all united one, then the way we grow into Christ, who is the image of God, is by growing in these avenues of truth, goodness, beauty, community, that, that, that we become more alive, right? Um, Athanasius, Irenaeus, I always get mixed up. It's Irenaeus, a Greek bishop who lived in the second century. The glory of God is a human being fully alive, right? Like that kind of idea is that we're walking in the fullness of who we were created to be in the image of Christ, which means we're all going to look different. We're distinct. But to walk in the fullness of in the life of Christ is to walk in to the fullness of who God made us to be. And now a word from our sponsor. Wait, what's a sponsor? This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We all need help processing emotions, dealing with challenging situations, or working through conflict. But sometimes we need professional help. I've had a few times in my life where I saw a professional therapist to help process anxiety, work through pain in the church, or just get an emotional checkup. If you're thinking of starting therapy, BetterHelp can be a great place to start. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash curiously today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash curiously. How would you describe to someone who, again, this term might be unfamiliar to them, different ways that we go about seeking spiritual formation, experiencing spiritual formation, and maybe especially help us understand the tension that you've already kind of brought up of we aren't creating ourselves. We aren't responsible for, this isn't a workspace salvation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And yet, like right. you said earlier, it's not like we're just done and we have no role to play in any of this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, the way I think about it is these kind of great traditions, um, right? So there is something about, like A.W. Tozer's line, tell me what you think about God, and I'll, and that's the most important thing about you, right? And I think there's that, there's an element of that that's true, right? Uh, I think overstated in some ways, but there's an element of that that's true, right? That the, the ways we think about God, our theology, our practice, our wisdom of knowing how to apply the right things in our lives is really important. Like that's the truth that we we read and we um, were traditioned and we grow by reading the Bible. And I think that, but that's like the only way that I was told to grow. And I, I kind of referenced that earlier. Like just pray and read the Bible. Okay, I have this sin problem. Well, just pray more and read more. Okay, well, I'm I'm still struggling with these habits. No, no, no. What you need to do is join the four more Bible studies. And once you you understand <laughs> it, then you can apply it. 
Yeah. And I think God is maybe just um, shatters our minds, right? He is, he is the mysterious one. And so there's different avenues of growth. So one is reading the Bible and praying. That's a, that's a foundation, legitimate. I'm not saying, I'm not saying less than that. Right? I'm saying, but there are some other ways to walk, right? So um, habits, right? So thinking about showing up to worship is a habit. Um, thinking about like silence and solitude. I think in prayer, I thought, and as an introvert, as I always thought I was a bad prayer because like, once I said my four things, like I'm out of words, right? Like, I, what else do I <laughs> uh -huh. say? And I think like getting this tradition of like the contemplative practices where you actually, prayer is more listening than it probably is talking. And so being in silence, working on even your breath, right? Like your embodied nature of like uh, the Jesus prayer or different habits of prayer um, in your postures and that, like all of that affects you. And so walking in that, and then also just, you know, accountability, walking alongside confession, um, having the community of faith around you to spur you on. I think all of these ways are are things that Scripture, right, our foundation encourages, um, but the, that God gives us more tools through the history of the church. That's what I wanted to show in the book. It's like through the history of the church, there's all of these things. And oftentimes we think, well, Confession's Catholic, or um, contemplative is Orthodox. That's not who we are. But I want to say, well, the first, you know, this is part of my draw to Anglicanism, like the first 1,500 years of the church is not Catholic or Orthodox. Those are our brothers and sisters in the faith. Yeah. And so rather than throwing all that out, like what do they have to teach us to grow, and how have they grown, right, in these models of faith? That's so helpful. Um, so many of the episodes that we have already done have referenced theological differences across these traditions, but I've so appreciated how many people have said, these are our brothers and sisters. We have to be curious. We have to ask questions. We have to mm -hmm. see what we can learn um, from our broader history that we share. Alex, is there anything about this question, um, how do I know if I have a strong relationship with God that we haven't covered yet that you think would be important for people who, again, not this kid necessarily, but adults that hear that question and go like, gosh, yeah, how do I know that too? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I reference in my book that I think is uh, more and more maybe poignant or, or I start to ask people a lot, it's like, when when did you grow most in God? Mm. And some people will say retreats or discipleship relationship, but more often than not, it's some great pain or suffering where God felt the most distant, where your relationship, your relationship with God felt like the most weak, that God actually draws nearest to you. And so in those moments where you feel like, where, God, where are you? I think you look back on those and think, God, you carried me the whole way. And I wouldn't, wouldn't wish that were worse than me. I don't want to do that again. Yeah. But that's the way you grew me. And so I think, like, especially, especially for a young person asking this question, who may be thinking, like, I don't feel like God's close. I don't feel like I have a strong relationship with God. I think, like, coming alongside more wise people, older people to say, um, to, to ask them that question. Like, when when did you grow them? Or when did you feel? And I think you'll just see like in your wisdom as you grow older, you look back on those times where it's just like all you can do is show up sometimes. Yeah. And it was those habits of grace. Uh, DA, I think it's D.A. Carson talks about habits of grace where you, like, you put your sails up and you hope the wind blows. You don't control the, the wind, but yeah. you can kind of keep putting the sails up. And when the spirit of God blows, you'll move. But it often, there's these seasons where it feels like, man, I am weak. I'm dependent. I can All I can do is show up. And I don't feel like this is doing anything. And I think the more that I've seen that in my life, these, these people who radiate an inner light, these people who we admire and respect, often there's like a deep suffering wound that makes them these gracious, kind, patient, spirit-filled people. 
And so I think like viewing our suffering and our pains not as impediments to God's growth or a strong relationship, but the very means that God is using to cultivate a strong relationship. Yeah, that it, and it goes back to what you said about the church and that even personally, like in my experiences of great suffering, part of what made that possible to be used by God was the fact that there were people I could go to and both grieve with me, but also people that could say what you said before I'm out of it, before I can look back and go like, oh yeah, God really used that in my life. When you're in the midst of it and it feels like that's impossible, there is a brother or a sister who's like, I was not in your exact shoes, but I was in something similar. And by the grace of God, that ended up being used in powerful ways. And then that's part of the way that it gets used is that witness of, of that person to you that is a real comfort, sometimes surprisingly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I'm just thinking about the mentors in my own life who have walked alongside me. Uh, the A probably didn't say, hey, you know, it's dismissed to say, hey, it'll get better. Like when you're in it, yeah. right? Like it's okay. <laughs> yep. You know, God yep. works this together for the good of those who love him. Like not helpful, right? God's sovereign, like not helpful. Uh, true, also not not right now. Um, yeah. And just like to, to know that somebody who's suffered and just, just look you in the eyes and say, I know, and yeah. this is terrible. And I don't know all you're going through or all what it's like, but I know that God is walking with you. Like that's the promise of the gospel. Yeah. I think maybe like one of the, to go back to baptism, like God is not going to abandon you. Mm-hmm. God has promised to walk with you. And I think like the most interesting about Jesus' baptism, right? He's baptized. Next verse, and the spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. <laughs> like that's not usually everything about like spirits leading, right? Like the spirit is yep. you know, leading me to green pastures. No, the spirit led Jesus to be tempted by the devil and to, and to, to feel the aloneness and hunger and pain. Uh, and that's the life walking with God, but but the reality that God walk, walks with us, right? And I think like one of the most yeah. tragic questions of the Bible is is God's to, to ha- where are you, mm. right? This, this close intimacy, and then Adam thinking like he needs to hide from God. Where are you? Like God is seeking companionship with you. God's seeking mm. you to God's seeking to walk with you. And sometimes in our sin, we hide from him. But all along, saying that, like a good father, right? Like, come, like yeah. I want to be near you, especially when you're in pain. Um, and I think like that promise in baptism, that, that God is going to walk this with you. And when he feels, doesn't feel like it, even when it hurts, even when you don't feel, you know, you don't think it, God is with you. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that that pastoral answer as well. Um, I've said before on the show that that I like to imagine uh, that the kid who's asked this question is in my church, and for now, let's imagine this kid is in your church, and mm-hmm. you're the you're the one wearing a collar. So she comes up to you and says, "How do we know when we have a good relationship with God? What would your kind of short kid answer be that she could understand?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. So Justin Early, Justin Whitmull Early, um, Habs the Household, he has this great liturgy that I've done with my kids, putting them to bed. Mm. And he, so maybe I would take this child and look him in the eye and say, do you see my yeah. eyes? Yes. Do you see that I see your eyes? Yes. Do you know that I love you? Yes. Do you know that I love you no matter the good things you do? Yes. Do you know that I love you no matter the bad things you do? Yes. Who else loves you like that? God. Rest in that love. And I think like the, mo- like the most meaningful time is when my daughter like switched the, sw- uh, switched the script and like, okay, <laughs> now I'm going to do it to you, daddy. And it was oh. like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, um, no matter the good things, no matter the bad things, that God loves you and we can rest in that love. Mm-hmm. And so to, to kind of, you know, to affirm this child, you seem to be desiring grace and you seem to be wanting to put your faith to practice, then trust your baptism and trust that God Mm -hmm. loves you. Mm -hmm. Trust that no matter the good things or bad things, God is walking with you, that you you are as secure as Christ is seated in the heavens now. That's Mm -hmm. good news. You can start doubting God when God starts doubting Christ. 
and Christ is pretty secure. And so you have a strong relationship. You, you, God is walking with you. Be faithful, desire grace, walk with him, and he's with you. Mm, thank you so much, Alex, for that. That is a, a beautiful way to end and a good reminder too. so many of the folks who are listening are trying to figure out not just answers to these questions, because these are questions grownups have, but trying to figure out ways to not just give their kids information or give other kids in their church information, sure. but to nurture a relationship with God. And that regular practice you just described, I think, is a good example of how to do that. So thank well, you. Thank you, so thank you for answering yeah. this question. I'm, I'm honored to do it and, and thankful to be on. Dr. Sossler said something early in this episode that many of us have probably thought before. He said he was talking to his wife about his answer to this question. How do we know if we have a good relationship with God? And when he said his answer was to trust in God, remember our baptism, know we have a good relationship with God as a gift of God's grace. She asked, so we don't have to do anything? So many of us have asked a question like this. And this question sums up a lot of the tension we explored in this episode between God's totally unmerited favor for us and our sense that we have something that we should do in response. But a good theology of God's grace flips the question a little bit. If we have to earn God's favor, it makes sense to ask, what do we have to do? If God's favor is a gift to us, the question becomes, what do I get to do? What does God's grace in my life enable me to do that I couldn't do before? Can I show kindness to my enemies where before I kept only returning hatred with hatred? Can I sacrifice the things I have for the sake of people who can't repay me, whereas before I hoarded everything I had? Can I trust God for the future instead of creating my own sense of security, trampling over other people so I can stay prosperous and safe? In other words, in what ways can I show God's love and grace and goodness to others as an overflow of what I receive from him. Curiously Caitlin is a production of Holy Post Media. Produced by Mike Stralo. Editing by Seth Gorvett. Theme song by Phil Vischer. Be sure to follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And leave a review so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary, plus cute kids, and never any butt news. 